can tell how someone feels just by looking at them or what they share online. To the outside world, our lives may look perfect, even if in reality they aren't. I'm always worrying about doing well at school, and with the end of year You can't tell how someone feels just by looking at them or what they share online. To the outside world, our lives may look perfect, even if in reality they aren't. I'm always worrying about doing well at school, and with the end of year test coming up, I'm not sure how much longer I can cope. My thoughts swarm around my head, sometimes keeping me up all night. Some days it's just all too much, and I feel like I'm lost in space. When I did badly on one of my tests, I just about kept it together until I got home. Then I broke down crying in front of my mum. She listened for a bit, and then she told me that, just like physical health, we all have mental health. It's our feelings, our thinking, our emotions and our moods. She then said that feeling down, anger and stressed is a normal part of life. Just like it's normal to feel happy, confident and carefree sometimes. We all have positive and negative emotions that come and go based on what's happening around us. These are everyday feelings. Good mental health means experiencing negative emotions. It's not always about being happy. Mum can relate to the feelings of stress. So when mum suggested I take a break from everything and do something I enjoy, I actually took her advice. So I made myself a hot chocolate, snuggled off in a duvet and watched a film. And you know what? Afterwards, I felt so much better. Mum should take her own advice. Most of us only ever share the good things. We don't like to share how we really feel. Every morning when I wake up, negative thoughts stream through my head. Getting out of bed and pretending I'm okay takes all the energy I have. As the day goes on, the negative thoughts turn from a stream into a river. The water rushes through my head so loudly it's hard to concentrate in lessons. And some days it's so bad, it feels like a waterfall that's trying to pull me over the edge. Everything is so overwhelming. I didn't think my friends would understand if I told them how down I was feeling. But when Sasha opened up to me about how stressed she was feeling, I told her. I wasn't sure how to bring up how I'd been feeling, so I started by saying that I didn't feel like myself. Just her listening made me feel like she understood. She told me some things that had helped her, so I tried them too, but it didn't make much of a difference. Even when I tried to be around my friends, I felt alone. The things I used to enjoy weren't fun anymore. I was really worried about Andre and not sure what to do. He was quiet and wasn't hanging out with us like he used to. So I asked our head of year for some advice. He suggested I get Andre to speak to him since his negative feelings weren't going away. I didn't want to speak to our head of year but I also didn't want to keep feeling so down, so I went. He said that sometimes we have overwhelming feelings that can be more intense than our everyday feelings. These feelings hang around for a long time and change the way we feel, think and behave. They can stop us doing what we want to in life. That's what I was going through. He also said that if we're physically unwell, we let people know, we ask for help. It should be no different with mental health. Sometimes our overwhelming feelings are brought on because of things in our life. Sometimes they happen for no reason at all. After hearing this, I felt much less alone and it felt good to talk. Scientists have found exercise can help when you're feeling low. So our head of year encouraged me to sign up to the school football club, which Sasha was already in. I still have days when the river is there. But now I'm beginning to understand my mental health. I'm learning how to cope. Our head of year reminded me that my friends, family, teachers and lots of others at school are there to help just as much as he is. I had no idea the people around me could be so understanding. And while it's not always easy to talk about my mental health, the person I'm talking to might be able to help. If you don't feel like talking, that's fine. 
You could try writing, sports, reading, art, music, playing with your pet, whatever makes you feel better. If you're the person someone talks to when they're struggling, just listen with no pressure or judgment. You don't have to have the answer. If you feel unsure about anything, you can speak to a trusted adult. Talking about mental health doesn't have to be difficult. After all, it's something we all have. Excuse me, Abhish sent us here. For the gender identity class, this is boy and I'm girl. Hi. Hi, I'm Angel and I'm gender fluid. Sometimes I feel like a boy, sometimes like a girl, sometimes like both and sometimes like neither. That is my gender identity. It could be different from my gender expression and my biological sex. You guys follow? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. No. Wait. If it hangs between your legs, it's your sex. It physically manifests, it's your sex. But society thinks in two. Doesn't mean that it is true. Gender identity is part of that of you. If you want to be a boy or a girl, or you want your special fashion to unfold, you get to choose how you express. And the way you want to dress, you get to choose how you would like to be a dress. Okay. So, how would you like to be addressed? Like you like to be addressed as he or him, and you like to be addressed as she or her. I like to be addressed as they or them. Wait, isn't that plural? <sighs> if a friend is bringing someone and you don't know their gender, wouldn't you say, I hope they like pizza? Oh, yeah. So, should I introduce you as, this is Angel, they are tonight's host? There you go. You got it. But what if someone makes a mistake and only calls you she? Oh, God. Every time I misgender, it's conditioning. I try to remember. But after the hundredth time in a day, it gets difficult. I'm a they. Like you're a she and you're a he. Uh, no, I'm a she. And he's a he. Exactly. And now, there's someone else I want you to meet. I'm Mehek. I'm a trans woman and my pronouns are she, her. When I was a child, they said I was boy. But inside, I was a girl crushing on black from Troy. I'm comfortable in my skin, no one to share this pain. This phobia is the exact opposite of joy. And what about work? Us transgender folks don't get employed. Our bank accounts are a gaping void. We move ports for basic rights. <laughs> but nobody in India has toilets. That's not the point. Every day is a brand new fight. Oh my god, that's so terrible. Our families don't understand. Mine took me to a strange god man. Cis people think that we're a trend. Haters will wait for our life to end. That's... that's horrible. But what can we do? How, how can we help? Hmm. When someone doesn't conform to what's in your head, head is the law. Just give them the space to be whatever they want to be. Okay, okay, I will, but I don't get all of it. It's so confusing. You don't have to get it. You just have to respect it. Just respect it. That makes sense. So we just have to be decent human beings? Yes. We can try to do that. <laughs> Just give everyone the space to be whoever they want to be. Hi guys, my name is Luka Gaudi. I'm a gender fluid person. Hi everyone, my name is Sushant Devgikar. Hi, this is Doel. And my 
pronouns are they, them, and they are. My pronouns are he and him. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. We can all exist together. Because this world is a huge space and this space for all of us, we all can exist together. So you don't have to get it. All you need to do is respect it. You might not get us, but you can respect us. Just, just remember, you don't have to get it. You just have to respect it. Thank you. Good morning, good morning, and how is everyone today? Well, as usual, I am Fakwida Watson-Jones, and of course, today is a very special day on Tea Time with, of course, your truly. Today, we'll be speaking about World Mental Health Day and sexual orientation. And just for you to know, this is our this um, program is being recorded and live streamed on Facebook at SRHR Adventures with Dr. Pat. And just remember, you can also view this episode on at Tea Time Conversations on Instagram. So today being the 10th of October, 2020, we are celebrating World Mental Health Day. And it comes in a time when our daily lives, as you know, have changed considerably as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Additionally, it has brought many challenges for everyone, especially our essential workers, whether you're a nurse, a doctor, a lab technician, a hospital driver, a water hospital maid, a porter, it doesn't matter once you are an essential worker, because these essential workers are providing care in the most difficult circumstances while going to work and fearful of bringing home COVID-19 to their families. However, one of the greatest challenges during this pandemic is of course access to sexual reproductive health information and resources. And as such, today my focus will be on mental health in the midst, um, it's gonna be on sexual orientation, sorry, during our mental health day that we're going to celebrate. And this year, the theme is mental health for all, greater investment, greater access for everyone. So joining me today to have a better understanding of sexual orientation and mental health are Christopher Martin Franz and Riza Khan. So Christopher Martin Franz is a dear friend of mine. He is a 26 year old and is a public health professional and a mental health LGBTQ plus rights activist. He currently sits on the board of directors of the Epilepsy Foundation of Guyana, as well as the Guyana Parenthood Association. He also currently represents the MSM constituency for the Global Fund Country Coordinating Mechanism. Raisa Khan is a counseling psychologist and the owner of her own private practice, Naira Counseling and Psycho Psychological Services. Very soon after returning home two years ago from Barbados, where she completed a two years degree, Master of Science in Counseling Psychology with a distinction, she was offered the on-call psychologist position at Sasad Guyana. She would quickly go on, on to working as the on-call psychologist for St. Joseph Mercy Hospital, Equal Guyana, the Guyana Rainbow Foundation, Gaibo, and an international oil and gas company. She works with adults, youth, and children who have challenges with a variety of mental health and social issues. Some of these issues seen in therapy are related to depression, anxiety, difficult relationships, stress management, emotional regulation, personality disorders, and cases of abuse. 
One of the main goals for RISE's desire to work in the field is to be able to transfer not only this generation, but future generations in Guyana into healthier families and individuals through therapy and psychoeducational awareness. At this point, I am kindly asking each participant to mute your audio. And at the end of the session or during the session, we're going to have um, feedback where you can also ask questions. Remember, you can virtually raise your hands or you can type within the chat. So I must say, please, thank you very much for joining us today and do enjoy this session. This is going to be one that you're not going to regret because you are going to learn so much today. Remember, this is being live stream on Facebook at SRHR Adventures with Dr. Pat. And you can also view this session on at Tea Time Conversations. Okay, so enjoy. Hi, Risa. Hi, morning, Gita. Um, I just saw morning. Chris says he's here. So, <laughs> so maybe we could wait a two minutes just for him to sign in. Um, no. But I just want to say good morning to everyone. And thank you for joining us, especially on a Saturday morning when most people might be either on shift or they might be coming off shift or they might just want to sleep in. <laughs> uh, yes. So I want to say thank you for being here. And I know the persons are joining on the live stream because I can see them. I popped and I checked, I shared it from my page. Um, as Pepita mentioned, uh, I created my own private practice. So if you are interested or have questions after the session, you can also go to the Anira Counseling and Psychological Services page, A-N-I-R-A and you can also message me there or check out some of the videos we've done before. Um, so I just wanted to throw in that tidbit. Um, I know it's not a part of the agenda, but I was just curious, how did you guys feel about those videos? I thought that they were so good. We actually trial run them last night, but I didn't see the second sexuality one. I think it was so precious. Um, yes. I love how <laughs> India is pushing trans identity and normalizing um, anything else other than heterosexual <laughs> in, in India of all places. So yes, kudos to India on their efforts for several years now. Definitely. And I do expect today's session to be quite interactive because I know a lot of persons have questions, especially when it comes to gender identity and sexual orientation. Because I was speaking to some friends and they were like, Oh my gosh, I am so confused. Like, all right, no need to be confused. Just join in today. You're going to learn so much. I am so excited because you never know. I may learn something new today, definitely. <laughs> yeah, I think even when we were looking at the videos last night, I was like, all right, I knew all of those up until one point, <laughs> you know, because even though as we work in the community, um, and Chris will say this as well, that, you know, we're known as the AB, the alphabet people. And so even, you know, work in the community, you have to be constantly researching and stuff because um, persons are finding more ways to understand themselves. And I'm sure Chris will kind of hit on that in terms of, um, in terms of the ability over time to uh, understand yourself better and stuff like that. So uh, definitely um, it'll be interesting to say the least. And I am certain somebody too will take something, one thing. And I hope at the end we can ask what? what is one thing you can say you could take, take away from today. Okay, Chris is here. This hey, hey Chris, Chris. Good morning. Hello. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Hi. So. How much did um, I miss? <laughs> You didn't miss much. We just were basically gaffing, waiting for oh, you to great. come. So I hand the floor over to you. This is Hi. your time to gaff with us. Let us learn. <laughs> Literally, we've gotten to the point of the presentation. It's oh, <laughs> great. Perfect. All right. I'm going to share my screen now. All right. Thanks, Chris. All right. Let me know when you can see it. Yes, I can see it. Great. 
All right, great. So to begin, I'm just going to start by what we like to say, breaking the binary. Um, I know sometimes all these different terms, gender identity, gender expression, all these things can be a bit confusing. So I'm, I'm going to try to just clarify those things before we start. So first, there's your gender identity. That's how you think of yourself, how you perceive your own gender identity, your own gender. Gender expression is how you demonstrate your gender. It's your outward expression of your gender. Your biological sex is the organs, hormones, and chromosomes that define, define you. And your sexual orientation speaks to your physical, emotional, and spiritual attraction to someone. So we, we like to use, the, I've seen this so many times, the, gen, the gender bred person, or sometimes it's a unicorn, to kind of like just make it easier. So your identity is within your brain. It's your thoughts of how you identify, how you perceive your gender. And that speaks to your womanness or manness. Your expression is the outside of the gender bred person. So that's the, how they outwardly present. So that, that speaks to femininity and masculinity. Now, just something to note here with gender identity and gender expression, they don't necessarily have to correspond. Someone can identify as a man, for instance, but express themselves as feminine. So that's why sometimes there's so much confusion, I know, especially within Guyana and within the Caribbean region at large, where, because you see someone who might be dressing up in drag, for instance, there's the misconception that they want to be a woman or they identify as a woman. That's not correct. Someone can identify as one thing and express themselves as another thing entirely. So then your biological sex, that speaks to femaleness or maleness. And as I said, that is your organs. That's biology. Basically, it's in the name. It's biology. It's organs, chromosomes. And then something to note within biological sex is there is female, male, and someone can also be intersex. And just to note, intersex is not a sexual orientation because you're going to see the word sex a lot. So just don't confuse it too. Intersex is the new and accepted and updated terminology for what we've grown up hearing people refer to as hermaphrodites, for instance. It's people who their biological sex does not necessarily fit into the norm, the binary of female or male. They might have a mixture of um, female and male sex organs, for instance. And then your attraction, well, it's there in the heart. It speaks to who you're attracted to, who you connect with. And that brings us to sexual orientation. So, of course, the sexual orientation, orientation you know, the, um, the main one or the, the norm or the, or the default is heterosexual. That's most of the world's population, I believe identify as heterosexual and that's of course attraction to the opposite sex or gender and then you have people who identify as homosexual meaning they're attracted to the same sex or gender people who are bisexual they ident they are attracted to both sexes and genders which brings us to pansexual which is similar but different depending on who you ask and that's sexual attraction to all sexes and genders meaning the traditional binary of male female as well as non binary gender queer trans everything everything in the spectrum and then there are people who are asexual who aren't necessarily sexually or romantically attracted to anyone per se. No, there are others like demisexual, um, gray sexual, that kind of thing. The reason why they're not listed here is those tend to fall with the under one of these main ones here. They, they tend to be a, a mixture of or a branch of. So that's why they're not listed here. So now let's talk about some mental health issues in the LGBTQ plus community. Now, I just want to say here, I could have included some statistics, but in Guyana, there is a huge lack of information because there's not enough research being done. So we're lacking in a lot of information in that area of statistics as far as mental health issues within the LGBTQ community. Well, generally mental health issues in general, we're lacking in information. 
So I could find statistics from other places, but that's not really gonna speak to the Guyanese experience. So that's why I left it out. But these, the things that I, I included are things that are generally true everywhere. So one of those things is that people identifying as LGBTQ plus are at an increased risk of experiencing poor mental health or, ex or mental health issues. LGBTQ plus people are at a high risk of being victims of abuse, bullying, and discrimination. Uh, LGBTQ plus people are more likely to experience depression, suicidal ideation, self-harm, and alcohol and substance abuse. And odds are, if you know someone who is LGBTQ plus, you can ask them if they're willing to share with you. Many of them would attest to the fact that they have experienced these things. I can personally attest to the fact that I experienced depression for years. I, um, I attempted suicide twice and I self-harmed. And these things are not necessarily tied to sexual orientation. That's something that you should know because in my case, they weren't but it uh, they are factors that kind of influence that kind of thing. So now these are some of the statistics, the statistics I spoke about. And the reason why I included these is just to give you an idea, even though these statistics won't necessarily be the same for Ghana, it gives you an idea of the issues at hand. So there are some places where LGBTQ youth are three times as likely to consider suicide as their heterosexual counterpart. Some, they are four and a half times more likely to attempt suicide than their heterosexual counterparts. And two times as likely to express feeling sad or hopeless every day for two or more weeks in a row as their heterosexual counterparts. And some are four and a half times more likely to be the victim of a suicide attempt. Now, factors contributing to mental health issues in the LGBTQ community include discrimination, isolation, bullying, homophobia, internalized homophobia, and self-loathing. Um, internalized homophobia is a huge deal for members of the community, especially young people who are already, there's already so much confusion that comes from puberty and being in your formative years to add on top of that, identifying as something outside of the societal norm it leads to a lot of self-inflicted pressure and self-loathing. And it's very common in the members of the community who may have been raised very religious. But as I, I think we spoke about this, where it's not necessarily just those people though. There are some people who aren't necessarily raised religious, but because we have such a culture of homophobia in Guyana and in the Caribbean and so many other places, even people who aren't religious still have the idea that how they feel is wrong. So self-loathing is so common to the point where some people just accept it as a phase that most of us are gonna go through at some point or the other. So contributing factors continued, and now I'm gonna bring Raisa in to talk about some of these. Hello, Raisa? Right, thanks. Yes. Thanks, Chris. I know it's kind of wonky how we jump on and jump on each other like that. Right. <laughs> Hi. Yes. Good. So, thank you. I wanted to just talk about Chris. Go back one. That's the barriers. Right. So, contributing factors. So, I wanted to take a look at it from a psychological standpoint. So, when persons come into therapy one of the first kind of things we're looking at is, do you have a family history of mental health or social issues like abuse or substance abuse? So those are one of the kind of earlier stages of assessment we're gonna do and can definitely be a contributing uh, set of factors. Environment and the sense of safety. So we are dealing with homophobia. We either LGBTQ or not. Um, can intend. Oh, uh, Raisa. If they feel unsafe. 
Right, so you're kind of breaking up. I don't know if Chris is having that same feedback, but you're kind of breaking up on my end. I am actually. I thought it was. I thought it was an issue with my connection. Oh. Rise again. You try speaking now. Let me see if it's still happening. Fukuda, can you hear me? I can hear you. Um, Raisa will have to sign in back. Um, right. But in the meantime, while she does that, um, Chris, probably I can show the video explaining the different types of sexuality while we wait on Raisa. So I will share my screen, um, but you need to stop yours first so I can share okay. mine. Okay, let me Please. stop sharing mine. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. All right, perfect. So I'm just going to show a video that explains the different types of sexuality that Christopher would have spoken of, and that will give us time for Raisa to sign in. Gender and sexuality are two concepts that are incredibly individualized. And so, it shouldn't be surprising that they are so complex. It can be hard to navigate the world of sexuality due to the different terms and labels. This video aims to help you navigate this world by arming you with some okay, I'm back. definitions <laughs> so and sorry. examples of 10 different sexualities, some of which you might not even know about. 1. Bisexuality The definition for bisexuality is actually something that's debated. Originally, the standard definition was attraction to both genders. However, as understanding of gender has evolved, people have argued for an evolved definition of bisexuality. Some use the definition of attraction to your own and other genders to incorporate non-binary genders within its definition. Some famous examples of people who are bisexual are Brandon Yuri from the band Panic at the Disco and actress Angelina Jolie. 2. Homosexuality this is one of the terms that most people tend to be familiar with. It means attraction to one's own gender, and is sometimes referred as gay or lesbian. Famous examples include comedian Alan Carr and presenter Sue Peterson. 3. Heterosexuality Heterosexuality is probably the most well-known sexuality, and whether right or wrong, it is often thought of as the default. This is known as heteronormativity. It means attraction to genders other than your own. It's most commonly used to refer to binary genders. 4. Pansexuality Pansexuality is defined as an attraction to all genders. Some say those who are pansexual don't care about gender when it comes to their attraction, though not all agree with this assessment. Some people also use this sexuality and bisexuality interchangeably. Miley Cyrus is a notable person who is pansexual. 5. Polysexuality Polysexuality refers to people who are attracted to two or more genders. Typically, bisexuality and pansexuality are types of polysexuality, though not all people who are polysexual use these terms. 6. Asexuality Asexuality is one of the lesser-known sexualities. It refers to someone who doesn't experience sexual attraction to any gender. This doesn't mean, however, that they never have relationships or sex, which are common myths about asexuality. Bojack Horseman, the TV show, explores asexuality through one of the major characters, Todd Chavez. 7. Gray Asexuality This is similar to the previous sexuality. However, instead of never experiencing sexual attraction, someone who is gray sexual may very rarely experience sexual attraction. They are still valid under the asexuality umbrella, despite occasionally experiencing sexual attraction. 8. Demisexuality Demisexuality, again, can technically fall under the asexual umbrella. People who are demisexual do experience sexual attraction, but only after an emotional connection is created. They wouldn't find a stranger on the street sexually appealing, but after they get to know someone well, the possibility of sexual attraction is there. Demisexuality is considered the halfway point between asexuality and allosexuality, those who experience sexual attraction. 9. Androsexuality Androsexuality is a sexuality that outside of LGBT circles is not well known at all. It refers to someone who is attracted to a masculine gender presentation. This can refer to anyone of any gender, 
Man, woman, or non-binary. 10. Gynosexuality Gynosexuality, like androsexuality, is not well known. It refers to someone who is attracted to a feminine gender presentation. This could again refer to any individual of any gender. We hope you feel more informed about sexuality after watching this video. Which sexuality do you most identify with? Which sexualities were new to you? Be sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel if you'd like more great content. Okay, Christopher. Um, I'm back. <laughs> okay, Rise. <laughs> great. I had to move location. Sorry about that. <laughs> right. So where were we? We were talking about contributing factors. Chris, if you could just bring up back the presentation. Thanks. Right. So what we're talking about is obviously your rejection or acceptance by your family, your friends, and your community, right? Because um, like Chris would have talked about the homophobia, discrimination, isolation, you're going to more than likely isolate if it is that you are feeling rejected. You're not going to go out there and face discrimination or face um, even physical abuse in some countries where persons are attacked for being LGBTQ or um, in the video where the uh, trans person is walking down the road with like flowers and you know people are watching and stuff that constant fear of being watched and being um, criticized or judged uh, you're more than likely going to and that kind of connects with Chris's point of isolation um, Chris barely you know mentioned just passed by culture and religion culture and religion in Guyana has a huge role um, because I have seen the difference between a family who's maybe culture or religion or um, the lack of religion plays a role in the acceptance of that person's um, sexuality and or gender identity. And I can tell you as a therapist, I have seen the difference between persons whose orientation is accepted by at least a few people. And I've seen the difference when persons have no sense of um, acceptance uh, within their family group or their support system. Um, the development and access of pro LGBT groups like Equal Diana Gaibo and GTU, these are uh, a huge deal because in countries where we have seen um, these groups uh, being uh, kept from developing, where persons don't have access to those groups, we do see the difference in um, mental health uh, because persons don't have that access to a support system. The next point I mentioned, the psychological, medical, and legal services. Um, if we alone, very stressed, very overwhelmed, and that will contribute to your mental health. And last but not least, government policy. As I mentioned before, what our governments and countries say about LGBTQ rights, women rights, Riza. She's gone again. <laughs> oh my. Right. What, what our. Well, she comes back. Oh, she's there. Oh, right. Back. <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, while. Yeah, this is my last point, just so I can stop and figure out what's happening. But yeah, government policy has a huge deal. Either your government in your country accepts and understands that discrimination is a crime or their pro LGBTQ rights. And so that can be a huge deal um, for your mental health when we compare with say Canada that has you know equal rights and marital rights and stuff like that. We do see, we're not saying like, obviously Canada has lots of mental health, but there's like millions of people here, right? So there are, this, it's a great, it's like when you compare 700,000 people with like, I don't know, in Toronto, there's like 30 million or something. Like the, the comparison is quite grave and, and it does come down to social services, advocacy, awareness, and so forth. Okay, I'm done for now. Chris, take over. I'm gonna figure <laughs> out what's going on my computer. All right then. So now, uh, Riza, 
if you're still here, I, I think you should jump in. You feel free to jump in on some of these I'm if here. you want to. Sure. So some barriers to mental health services. Um, I, I, I should have switched availability and affordability because I think you need to address availability first. There is a lack of mental health services and health professionals in Guyana. Um, pretending otherwise would be just that, pretending. There is a huge lack of mental health services in general, but especially for LGBTQ people. Um, and that brings us to affordability, to affordability where when there, there are services available, it's not necessarily the most affordable for everyone. Um, some people can't afford it, but the reality is a lot of people can't afford to pay um, just under ten thousand dollars per session is just a fact. And then within affordability, there's also, you know, considering factors like transportation. Not everyone can, you know, that's something that you also have to consider. It's not just paying for a session; it's also being able to get there and get get from there when you're done. So it's it's not always affordable. And then another barrier to mental health services is negative experiences. Um, I can personally attest to this. Um, I'm, I'm allowed to say this, um, she isn't, but I'm allowed to say that Riza is my therapist. And she knows because we spoke about this that before I went to her, I actually went to two mental health professionals before her. And it were, both of them were terrible experiences. The very first one, we did absolutely no talk therapy. It was just um, pills. And the second one, I was actually ghosted by my therapist. The, the second therapist that I had, like, you know, just stopped showing up, wouldn't answer my calls or messages. So, I mean, imagine, because Riza's dealt with me, so Riza knows. Imagine I, you're, you're counseling someone or you're giving therapy to someone who has abandonment issues and then you abandon them. And one of the things, <laughs> it's a huge barrier. It, it's something that put me off from <laughs> like, therapy. And I can say that one of the things that made me like seal the deal for me with Riza when I approached her is the first time I approached her about therapy, she was actually available for like two weeks and then she would be unavailable for like a month. And she told me that she would be unavailable for, for like a month. So she would prefer instead of a starting and then she'd be gone for a month, she would prefer if we just start after she gets back because she said she didn't want to, she didn't want to start for those two weeks. And then I have a whole month without her and I feel abandoned. And just her being so thoughtful and considerate about something like that, after my bad experiences, that was one of the things that encouraged me to actually stick with her because I had such a negative experience. And the thing is, Thank God I've, I eventually found Riza and, you know, she showed me that and showed me that she was the one for me because before that, you know, my negative experiences put me off from therapy for a few months and it actually set me back. It, it really did a number on me and put me in a worse position than I was. So negative experiences, that's a huge factor for people. And I tell people all the time, even if you have negative experiences, the thing is therapy is like, Think of it like any other product or service you would pay money for. I don't ever buy a phone without check testing. researching first, <laughs> testing them out, comparing phones to each other. Mm. Every therapist won't work for you. Even when yeah. I recommend people to Riza, I tell them all the time, she was amazing for me. She worked for me. That does not mean she'll work for you. Yeah. It means you give her a try, but you, it might not work for you. And that's yeah. just a fact. Yeah. The thing is, people have different experiences and sometimes people bond. I've heard people like, for instance, queer people say they would prefer having a queer therapist. I've heard black women say they would prefer having a black woman as a therapist. And a large part of it is that it's easier for them to relate to someone who has experiences similar to their own and who, who fits a place in society that they do, that right. they can relate to. And, so and then... And then sometimes we get the opposite effect whereby right. people don't want, like a young man may not want another man as a therapist because that's triggering for them to have a, that kind of deep level discussion with another man. So they actually will ask for a woman and vice versa. Right. 
Right. So is the main thing, the main takeaway there is negative experiences, unfortunately, like with everything else, sometimes you can't. Um, lack of parental support is a huge barrier when it comes to youth. Um, I experienced this myself, you know, at the very beginning of me realizing I was depressed as a young teen, I wanted to have therapy, but my mother at the time, you know, had a very traditionalist, archaic view of therapy that, you know, most of many people in the Caribbean have, unfortunately, um, where she didn't take it seriously. Talk I'm happy. To me. <laughs> what? Yeah, your mother will be like, just talk to me. I had a client tell me that up to yesterday. My right. my mother says, just talk to me, but then they have no concept of understanding or openness right. or gentleness. <laughs> right. So I'm, I'm happy to say that my mother is, has educated herself now and her views are different. But for a lot of people, that's not the reality. Their, their parents stick with our views. And when you're a young person and you need uh, parental consent, it, it's, it's not just like a difficulty. It's an, it's an absolute barrier. It's an absolute obstacle. That's a wall that you can't pass. Yeah. Ethically, uh, ethically, we need persons who are under 18 to have a their consent form signed by their guardian, a guardian. Um, yeah. And even some people have asked, like, can my older sibling sign for me? And depending on the case, depending on the age of the person, like they might be just 17, going to be 18, I may allow a older guardian, like sibling, um, but traditionally 14, 13, nine, that needs the, like an actual parental guardian. And that can right. be really hard when it's your parental guardian who is the one who is driving you into therapy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I've seen that, especially with public schools. When I work with public school teenagers, they're like, oh my God, Raisa, can I just come to you? And I'm like, let's talk about how that's going to work. Because <laughs> y'all are first formers. And so it is a good time to kind of talk about the ethics at that time with them on what is our barriers to even parental, even to come into therapy as a youth. Right. Um, another barrier for LGBTQ people specifically, fear of being outside. Um, that's a huge one. And I will say from not my personal experience, but the experience of friends I have who are religious, for instance, a lot of them might seek, seek out a counselor within the church or something like that, or that they know from church. And that is a huge barrier because they, they don't feel comfortable, you know, talking to that person about their LGBTQ specific issues because they're afraid of being outed. And why that's a huge barrier is because as, you know, Riza told me, when we were in therapy, when I was in therapy with her, you know, if you're not completely honest with your therapist, you can't really expect the therapy to work. You're, you're leaving out huge pieces mm -hmm. of the puzzle. So yeah. that's the hugest. You know, you're just actually, going around a circle. I, you're just going around in a circle because I have been, I've talked with clients like after, you know, say two, three sessions and something just doesn't, like something's not adding up, right. you know, and you're like, there's, like, you don't want to obviously put your clients on the spot, but in your mind, you're thinking something happened and this person is not telling me. Um, something went wrong in some kind of relationship, some environment, some event, because the average person would not think about this situation or have this kind of anxiety out of the blue. You know, like I had a client once tell me um, they didn't, they came and I guess in the, in the, in the first session, by the next session, we were doing some work and we we're talking about negative thoughts. And they said, oh, to be disowned. And we were like working on the wall and stuff, you know, uh, mm -hmm. we were working on, and I'm like writing, yeah, disowned. Then I'm like, wait, why are you scared of being disowned? And they're like, oh, because they don't like my girlfriend. And I was like, oh, you're LGBTQ. That makes, a so what would have seemed like an irrational negative thought, like mm -hmm. why are you scared of being disowned? became totally clear once I knew that their orientation, because when we talked about relationships, like the day before or that day, they said, yeah, I'm in a relationship. I don't ask LGBTQ. Like yeah. I'm, I can't look at someone and say, oh, you're gay, you're straight. Or it doesn't, does it at that moment, does it matter as we get into the issues, as we get into the goals, mm -hmm. you might want to mention that. Yeah. I, I want to come out to my family, <laughs> you know? So oh. yes, Chris. Right. So opening up is important. <laughs> I should also say fear of being outside 
doesn't just necessarily apply to their um their identity or their sexual orientation, but fear of being outed can also um mean like general the general population fear of being outed as in you know having people find out you're in therapy and i have to i have to you know i have to praise my therapist once again because this is something she spoke to me about she said you know you might see me out in public you might see me in social settings i might say hi but we're not going to really talk do expect much engagement from me and the reason why is i don't want people who know i'm a psychologist see me talking to you and put two and two together or jump to the conclusion how do you know her Right, exactly. So Riza explained that to me, and she, I'm very happy to say, always maintain those boundaries. So I didn't, I wasn't afraid, of, I wasn't afraid of being outed. I was, I was very open and public about being in therapy. I shared that right. with people, so I didn't mind. But there are people who do mind. So she actually considered that, and I was very appreciative of that. That she, you know, considered that there are some people who and let you know. <laughs> but, you know, because otherwise I, I might have felt away like I'm seeing her in public and she's not talking to me right, <laughs> so right. and I and there have been times when maybe I missed that and I seen the client and then I was like oh my god did I tell them that I can't approach them or say hi right. to them and then I went into session next week and I first thing I addressed was you know I know we saw each other in like Gipland I, I you know I'm sorry and they're like no you already mentioned that I heard you talk about that in a video I heard you talk about that at a swag session and I was like, oh, okay, thanks for listening. You know, um, that they were able to remember that, that, and that's why it's important for me to always be talking about ethics because sometimes we forget something, you know, and people remember, so it's good. Right. Um, the next thing is the lack of LGBTQ sensitivity. Right. And I think we kind of touched on that a bit in fear of being outed. There's, you know, just generally not all therapists are equipped to deal with LGBTQ issues, unfortunately. And yeah. for some people, it might not be a huge part of why they're in therapy. For me, it wasn't, but it still was a part of it. And even though it, it was a minor part, thank God, I, my therapist, I met her through Sasa. That's, Sasa helped me connect with her and they provided the service. And she worked with the community. So I was fortunate to have a therapist who understood LGBTQ issues, who I could talk about my relationship issues with, who I could talk about, you know, family rejection with, because she has worked with the community. So she understands. Someone who doesn't work with the community, honestly, they, they might not really service their client well, because, you know, it's completely out of their depth. Right. You can't, you, um, and, and, and I, like I had a discussion with someone the other day and they were like adamant, like they wanted to see their therapist in person at that time because of COVID and um, some other things happening. I could not see persons in, in my office. And so I was like, you know, check this person, check. And I always check her own first. Before I refer someone to somewhere, I want to make sure they're LGBTQ friendly. And so I did that. And then they went and they were like, oh, it was a time clash and then, and so on. And and I was, I said to them, they're like, oh, well, so now it's, now it's not the time clash. Now it's, I only want an LGBTQ person. Right. And I'm thinking, but you do understand that any properly trained psychologist can still show you empathy, can still show you respect, can still show you humility, you know? And I said, I completely get why you want that sensitivity of this LGBTQ community, like a person. But at the same time, if you're really in a really bad place and you need to see an in-person person therapist and there's no in-person LGBTQ therapist, then at least for the time being to just help with the process, help with the feelings to at least see someone um, who does have some sensitivity um, and is properly trained. Right. Um, then we have the flip side of that, which is, you know, having a therapist who puts too much emphasis on the client's LGBTQ plus identity. And that can happen, like, in my experience, <laughs> it can happen one of two ways, where either the therapist, like, hones in on the LGBTQ plus issues and and they act like the that is the only issue at hand that they have to deal with or so. 
Like, do and, you think that headache is related to your identity? Right, right. <laughs> so, like, as I said, and Rice, I can attest to this, as I said, my issues, my sexuality was a very minor part of why I went to therapy for. But imagine if I had a therapist who, you know, is not used to working with a community. And, and there are some people, unfortunately, who, who think that way. They're, they're ignorant in thinking that a lot of things, like, go back to that. Maybe you're depressed because you're gay. Like, you know, there are people who think like that, unfortunately. They're like, I'm depressed because my family don't like that I'm gay. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. So there's that. And then there's also the issue of having a therapist who might be genuinely curious. And I've heard of <laughs> stuff like that happening where the therapist decides, oh, I don't really know any gay people. Let me ask you all these questions. Like, yeah. what is it like? Are you a top or a boss? I'm like, the kind of thing. Like, <laughs> of course, I, I, have a, I had a therapist who works with the community. So right. that, this is not something I That's worry not about. That's important. It happens. It That's does happen. Important. Unless, and, and, and someone did ask me a question in like another video that I was doing um, a couple weeks ago or so. And they said, is it appropriate for like this, like teacher or something to ask the students about like when you're in therapy? Um, and I thought they meant their counselor was asking that. They're like, no, the teacher was mm. asking them like something about their sexual past. And I'm like, I said, well, I thought it was a counselor first. And I was like, well, I could understand if your counselor is trying to understand your sexual past, if your goal is related to like sexual health or sexual empowerment or relationship stuff. But they were like, no, 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 Rice, it's a teacher. And I'm like, oh, hell no. Why would a teacher be asking <laughs> you about your sexual past and stuff like that? And I think that that's where that fetishism comes from as well. And that curiosity and boundaries and, you know, as someone like I would not ask a question that's not in some way connected to right. whatever it is that we're discussing that day. I mean, and I just want to say on that point, I don't know if it was like later on in the presentation or if it was here. I want to say to this and to this, to talking about negative experiences in general, you're absolutely allowed to tell your therapist if you feel uncomfortable about something they ask you mm -hmm. or or. An ex a bad experience you had with them or what you perceive as a bad experience. It, you don't have to sit there and endure it or end therapy because of it. Yeah. You can speak to your therapist. If you feel like there is some kind of gray area and you feel uncomfortable with it, you can clarify with your therapist. You're fully allowed to do that. Yeah. So and, that, that's, that's also something to consider. And a lot of time it's actually a learning experience because I had something quite recently where like there was a miscommunication between me and a client and I didn't respond to like say a previous message but then I sent out my usual like booking sessions let me know day and time and they I guess between the two gaps in time they started to feel this sense of rejection like oh you didn't respond to that email but you're already asking me if I want to come to session next week and so they sent this in a text and as soon as I received that I called them right up and I was like what's going on I just received these texts and we clarified and it was actually through that questioning and that line of questioning that we realized. And I was like, let's take a step back. And I was like, I'm not sure why this is happening. I want to clarify that I am not intending to make you feel that way. But then I was like, let's talk about this for a little while. I said, where did you pick this up? Where did you, who made you feel this way by, you know, and it was a learning moment. And they were like, oh my God, I totally just projected an insecurity onto my therapist. And I'm like, it happened. That's why we're here. <laughs> I'm like, but they're like, oh my God, this is crazy. I can't believe that we just had this whole epiphany from just a text, you know, a text yeah. that they were feeling rejected. And I was like, you know, who, who's made you rejected feel this way before by not responding to like calls or emails or texts. And then they're like, oh my God. And they were like, it was a learning, yeah. it was a learning moment. And you can only have those learning moments if you are brave enough to be awkward with your therapist and say something. I'm too many Yeah, oh, I communicate. Rice, a quick question. Um, like for one session, how long would one session last? I guess you don't put like a particular time frame to one session. It just right. goes with the flow. So, no, it does not go with the flow. No. Because if, <laughs> if I let clients go with the flow, I'll be in therapy one client for three hours. Yeah. Um, no, the first session is pretty standardized globally. So the first session is an hour and a half. And then every session after that is 
technically supposed to be 50 minutes, but as Chris can attest, I never stay to the 50. I try to get it to 60 and worst case scenarios depend on the nature of what we're talking about that day. It can go a little bit further, but I'm this year, I'm really trying to hone into that one hour mark. Um, and I've even had clients think that, like, I remember I had a session, like the third session and the client, I was trying to lock up at that 12 o'clock and they're like, don't we have 30 minutes more? And I was like, no, <laughs> I'm like, the <laughs> first session was, I was like, I didn't say it like that, <laughs> but I was like, oh no. I said, the first session's an hour and a half. And I said, every session after is an hour. And they're like, oh, I thought every session's an hour and a half. And I said, no, <laughs> I was like, I said, I'm sorry. And then I have to explain why we have to stick to the hour because what ends up happening? And I have done two hour sessions, trust me. I'm exhausted at the two hour mark. You're exhausted at the two hour mark. You actually end up delving to, into too much. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when you sit with your therapist and you discuss just something within that hour, maybe hour and five, hour and 10, um, and that hour and five and 10 is usually like closing up the topic in a gentle way. Like think of it like making pastry, you know, like folding gently. But if you were to sit with a client for two hours, like Chris, as a client who would have passed through me as well, if every session was two hours, how would you feel? Like, I think we would have opened up too many cans of worms and I would then send him away with all of those feelings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because that's something that happens in therapy that people don't know like some days are hard like you're you're going through some deep seated trauma sometimes like stuff you've been sitting on for years and you feel emotionally exhausted afterwards I've had yeah. I've had people mm -hmm. say they actually like you know sometimes they don't look forward going to to look for they don't look forward to going to, to therapy because they therapy. know like you know they're they're genuinely, genuinely, they, they know what's coming next a lot. so imagine yeah. so you do that for two hours and i've had sessions like that where we dealt with some deep seated like major stuff and afterwards i was like all right i just want to go home and like lie in bed all day and just not move like <laughs> it's, it's a lot to deal with and another thing i think well yeah. for me personally why i like always kept the time in in mind too is and this is why also right so you know she let me know that we, we used to do once a week sessions and but she let me know that if there was ever a week I was having a really hard time and needed to I could come in early on the kind of thing and I only use that option once because I really needed to mm -hmm. and I try to always keep yeah. in mind like even if I was having a bad day not to like let sessions go too long or do extra sessions because mm -hmm. I thought that we would be heading into a uh, territory that I didn't want to be in, which is codependency. Because if I always know that I could go to my therapist multiple multiple times a week or go to my therapist and talk Soon to as two something hours, happens. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna deal with it myself. So a lot of times I had like a lot of stuff going on and I would make a mental note. Like when I see guys that we're gonna deal with it, I'm not gonna call her earlier than usual. And I'm not gonna go and have a long session. Like I went into each session knowing that okay, we're talking about this today. So like it's you know, so we, we avoid <laughs> codependency yeah. too, like you know, just because you have a therapist doesn't yeah, mean that... that sorry, Chris. No, but those no. are that's good points. That's good points because uh, a lot of persons because and I think this is one of the barriers technically as well to like persons honing into their mental health is also, um, they've watched too much TV, too much you, too much Lucifer, too much whatever, <laughs> too much suits. And, you know, they think that you're going to come and lie down on the couch and you're going right. to sit there <laughs> and your therapist is not going to say a thing. We're just going to be like, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. They're just going to say, mm -hmm. and how does that make you feel? Uh -huh, uh -huh. And writing their little notepad. That no, that's so Freudian. That's 200 odd years old. We but like, I think right, I think we're gonna get to that though. We we have a the section process. for that. So, we'll get to that. Okay. We'll get okay, to that. Fine. All right, and this is Ryza's right, so side. Let's get to my part <laughs> while I still have good internet. Right. Thank you, Chris, <laughs> for keeping me intact. Right. So, what disorders? A very common question we get again is what disorders or mental health challenges or even social mm -hmm. issues do we see in the LGBTQ community in Guyana? Like personally, what have I dealt with? Um, 
And so, of course, like I said, I was at Sasod, I'm at Gaibo. When Equal has challenges, I jump in there. Um, so you're looking at like almost, I would say a quarter, a quarter of the clients that I've seen in, in um, being LGBTQ. And so first and foremost, very common mood disorders. We have like depression and don't get me wrong. Um, don't get me wrong. When I say depression, yes, there are persons who do have depression episodes and just feel depressed. There are persons who will just write me like on the page and say, hi, I need a therapist. I am depressed. And I'm like, okay, let's start with how do we, how do we even know that? Right. Like how, how are you experiencing this depression? And so a lot of persons and, and, and a lot of persons, I don't know if they feel better with titles, like understanding what their feelings are. And first we had a very, we had a very long talk about with this. titles and diagnoses and, and understanding, I am not going to tell you you're anything you're not until I open up my big, beautiful DSM purple book and look through things and establish what's happening um so uh, i that, won't tell you you're depressed that's until, a, like, I, I just want to say i just want to say rise is being a bit dishonest there she <laughs> does not just open that dsm5 she's she's gonna open that then she's gonna research like 10 <laughs> other books and yes. papers she's gonna send you stuff to like I, I I can share with I can share this that we ha we did have a talk about yeah. titles and diagnoses because I had a bit of an emotional breakdown because we did a an assessment like coming down to the end of it mm -hmm. and um according to the assessment I you know was off the charts for something that Riza kind of suspected from early on but she shared with me after the fact that she suspected mm -hmm. very early on. She actually made a note of it in my file, but she never told me. I like the second <laughs> session. <laughs> yeah, it was the second actually, right? So she never told me this. She just researched it and read up on it and listened to me. And then she was like, all right, then I think we're ready to assess, you know? And then she assessed me. Even though we talked about it, I broke down and I, before I even cried, she was like, Chris, you know, a diagnosis doesn't, I know you feel like you're being labeled, but this is just going to help you get answers and it's going to help us, you know, know exactly how to deal with this. And she said, I'm telling you this right now because I think you're about to cry. <laughs> and she said, <laughs> and I started to cry because I didn't see <laughs> But ultimately in the end, I was happy because it provided so many answers and she gave me reading material to read on it. And as I'm reading it, you know, like after living my life, almost all of my life feeling these things reading it in a book and seeing you know explanations behind it and realizing where it comes from it was honestly in my adult life is one of the best moments in my adult life like finally being able to understand why I feel the things I feel right yeah mm -hmm. and that's and that's why we have to be so careful because if we say the wrong thing and then we send them out to do their bibliotherapy then it's like wait why she got me reading this thing she thinks I'm this you know, and so we have to be very mindful. So, so that was, and um, so that was, so we have depression, we have anxiety, social anxiety is kind of popping up there, very strong, people are not comfortable going out there, people are not comfortable interacting, I treated, same time I was treating Chris, I was also treating someone else with social anxiety, which was my first case of social anxiety at that time, um, and, and phobias, um, and person having um, kind of like phobias that were geared to basically what we call survivor traits. So they experience some traumatic things, they divide, develop survivor traits that then kind of lead into phobias and then you still have to also treat the trauma. So there's like layers within this thing as well. You know, it's not just, oh, you have one diagnosis and so that's it. People have comorbidity, which means they have more than one um, diagnosis happening and the doctors are shaking their head like, yes, we know comorbidity. Um, personality disorders, very common in Guyana. Very common so narcissism. <laughs> it's not called narcissism. It's called narcissistic personality disorder. Um, we have uh, BPD, so borderline personality disorder, and then antisocial, also very common in Guyana. It's not what you think. It's not like social anxiety. It's actually the quite opposite. You're actually very aggressive, very not understanding of social context and social rules. 
And yes, very much uh, like a rocket ready to go. <laughs> Um, and then trauma and abuse, very, very common, very, very common. Every, not everybody, but majority of my clients have some degree of um, some kind of emotional or verbal abuse um, or something traumatic. That can be anything. It doesn't have to be like molestation, but it can be um, they were robbed. It can be that the house burned down. It can be that they, um, you know, uh, I don't know, lost their virginity and their parents beat the crap out of them. You know, it can be anything. Um, that was traumatic and it sticks with them because then it embeds itself into the way that we think about stuff, right? And of course, I should have put this into the top, childhood emotional neglect, CEN, is becoming more and more prevalent in terms of what I'm seeing in my clients. And so childhood emotional neglect is what it sounds like. It is not just the slightly distant mother or father. It is a constant lack of emotional support, emotional validation, emotional recon or the, the rec recognizing that children have emotional needs and knowingly or unknowingly not providing for that. Who has problem? Chris. Next, right. Challenges continue. So rejection and abandonment issues. And like Chris said, like you can have this rejection and abandonment issues from whatever your past, you then have your LGBTQ related issues with maybe yourself and not want, not being sure how to love yourself, rejecting yourself, that internal homophobia Chris spoke about. And then say you have an issue, a negative experience with a therapist. This is now going to expand on your mental health challenges. Um, we see trust issues. Uh, of course, if you have been traumatized or um, emotionally or suffer from childhood emotional neglect, you're probably going to have trust issues. Attachment issues, we see a lot of that again as well. I didn't put that there. Emotional dysregulation. So these are persons who are not able to properly regulate their emotions. They um, can feel very out of whack. This is not the same thing as like bipolar or mood swings. This is persons who just on a daily basis are not sure what they're feeling, how to interpret an event, um, what is appropriate. You usually see this with CEN, trauma, but you also see it with persons who may have suffered with like a learning disability that went undiagnosed. So like autism spectrum. So you can be on the spectrum and you may not have so certain social skills and certain social skills can then equate into emotional dysregulation. Anger management, and I always say this, yes, we have a lot of angry people in Guyana, we do, but I know that there are people who come to me like, oh, I have anger management issues. And I'm like, okay, let's see. And as soon as I start, there's a little tool, I don't know, Chris remembers a little tool called the emotional wheel, and it's in pride colors. And so, I give it to them and I'll sit down and be like, okay, let's talk about your triggers. What triggers your, your anger? And they'll be like this, 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 and we'll go through. And I said, okay, let's look now at the emotional wheel. Is it anger? We look at that little sliver. Is it really anger that you are feeling? They're like, yes, it's anger. And I said, okay, let's look at the words. Are these words what you're feeling? No. I said, let's look at sadness. Is those are some of the words that you're feeling? Well, I guess. And I'm like, so it sounds like you were disappointed in your parent or your mother or your brother. Yeah. And I'm like, and that made you feel neglected. And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, so you're not angry. You're sad. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's that realization that they're like, okay, so what does that mean? I said, because we've, we've normalized aggression in Guyana in most of our interactions. And so it's easier for someone to put on that facade of anger or express anger because maybe they also have seen it being expressed as a normal way of responding to being hurt or disappointed. And voila, anger and management issues, but it's not always really anger. Relationship challenges, very common, everybody. Mm -hmm. I don't know what happened during COVID, but it's like people found out that their spouses or partners were cheating since 2019. And like, it's only now coming out. I have a ton, like more than a handful <laughs> right now of persons who have either been 
cheated on right before COVID or found out during COVID that they were cheated on. So I have a lot of people in grief right now trying to deal with grieving, the betrayal, the trust and stuff like that. Of course, now you enter into um, coping with that. So substance abuse comes in. And then, of course, if you look at that list, you can see how non-suicidal self-harm or suicidality is in there as well. And I actually put in that, that order for a reason to kind of show that if you're having rejection issues, you don't trust your partner, you're not sure how to feel about your emotions, it's making you angry, you're lashing out at your partner, you're drinking to cope, well, hot damn, suicidality might spring up, right? So like, I tried, I tried, I'm making sense, I tried, right? Yes. Chris, next one. <laughs> right, so. Perfect. So this is the main part I want us to touch on. What happens? <laughs> what happens? <laughs> and, and we, I know it's like a weird segue. We're like, okay, guys, we're following you. We're following you. Wait, how we reach the therapy now? This is a very particularly special kind of session today because rarely does like, a client and their therapist or a former therapist end up on the same kind of show. So we wanted you to guide, kind of understand that there are processes, processes to these things. And so I just wanted to like quickly kind of go through them and then Chris can interject and talk about if you remember certain things. Um, right. right. So first and foremost, making the appointment. For most counselors or therapists, you can find them either via email, contact number, Facebook page now a lot of us have Facebook page I have for the past like year um, some people have even like messaged through comments on the YouTube page so very quite interesting you know people people will go to certain lengths to get through to you right to ask questions so that's great persons comment on my videos so that helps me connect with them as well um, but make the appointment and we always try to because I work basically Monday to Saturday and then like nine to like up to about the last session can be like 7 p.m. Sometimes it's late, like it's an emergency. Yeah, I'll go up to 7 p.m. And so uh, I'm basically just fixing an appointment around your schedule most of the times, unless you, and, and also same day appointments, people, same day appointments are rarely going to happen because your therapist has probably already arranged their day around whomever. So for me, I, send out my messages on Sunday or Saturday even for the entire week. So my clients know where to pop themselves in. And there are people they don't, uh, there are people who have fixed sessions. If you come on a Tuesday at 2 p.m., if you want to keep coming on Tuesday at 2 p.m. for the next month, you can ask for that. You don't have to shift and change. I just send out that message every week because there are people who are shifting and changing. I think we had relatively fixed sessions, if I remember, like yeah. Thursdays or Fridays. Yeah, so I thought it was pretty fixed. So I thought it was pretty fixed. Uh, persons were pretty much uh, like aware of what day they were coming and stuff like that. It was very helpful because then you know how to plan. And because I was technically only at Sasa like Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, it was pretty given when you guys were going to come. Um, reviewing and signing the consent form. So now even though um, we are gone electronic because of COVID, you still have to review and sign that consent form. So the consent form is basically establishing, you know, what is counseling, what is therapy, what is expect. I even say in the line, like, there are not, there are going to be difficult days. There are going to be days where the topics you're talking about may give you anxiety, right? And then we talk about confidentiality and the importance of confidentiality. And then I do list the exceptions to confidentiality, basically, if there's any harm to anyone under, in, under the age of 18, if you, uh, if I get subpoenaed by the courts, which I'm not sure then when that will ever happen in Guyana, um, if there's any talk of present or future discussion of harm to yourself or anyone else. And, and so I always tell clients at the beginning, like if you had suicidality up to last week, that that doesn't mean like I don't have to do anything ethically on that. If you did have suicidality up to last week, you probably should be talking about, right? But technically, I don't have any ethical boundaries with that. Like I can I can let that can sit in session confidently. Um, and then we talk about typical things like appointments and making them and stuff like that. Um, Chris, did I forget anything? 
You didn't. How did you feel like signing a consent form? Like, did it make you feel like, because you went to therapist before and I have the impression that you did not sign a consent form to see the doctor. I did not. <laughs> <laughs> it, was a, it was a cowboy session. <laughs> I did not. Um, yeah, that was, that, that, that also helped. It was very formal, which I appreciated so much. <laughs> yeah. um, there, was, there were a lot of forms. I'm going to add more to the client assessment when you get there. Because yeah. I don't think a lot of people expect how thorough that is. Yeah. I certainly yeah. didn't expect it. And I could yeah. appreciate it as someone who was studying medicine at the time. I'm like, oh, it's it's a full, like, physical, like, <laughs> what for your brain before we start? <laughs> I was going to say, please don't tell people I'm physical. I'm not. Ethically, we are not supposed to touch you. Right. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, so client assessment. So this is going to vary by a therapist. Like, this is going to vary by a therapist. Like, I have mine, and it's a collection of two, one I used to use in Barbados, and another one that I felt was more meaty. Um, now, your consent, so, and I put this, you know why I did this client assessment like this? Because A, we have challenges with literacy in Ghana. We cannot ex have these expectations of people, because like in foreign, they just send you the client assessment before. Um, when I have uh, done therapy in Canada, you fill it out yourself in front of the office before really? you go in. That's very typical. And it's in the movies, right? Like well, it happens. But I find like in Ghana, we have to look at literacy. We have to look at people's understanding. People are coming and you're asking them if your family had background in schizophrenia. Like what is schizophrenia? And I feel like through talking them through the assessment, it adds so much more depth, depth to your knowledge of your client like I am not sure how many other psychologists do that I get the sense that there are one or two psychologists again who don't do that but for me it is so helpful in terms of understanding like what is your understanding of yourself and, and so the client I, assessment sorry go Chris no you go ahead and then I'm gonna add something yeah no the client assessment is basically there's an intake form we need that information there's an emergency contact we need to have an idea of like are you taking meds those things are important, you know, um, because meds can interact with each other. And then we go and we talk about your sleeping, your eating, your weight, your exercise. How do you, are you anxious? Are you depressed? What recent events have been stressing you out? Because you will see, I can tell the, from the pattern of those answers from you just answering those questions that something, because they'll say, okay, I used to work out for two weeks ago. I used to eat well until two weeks ago. I've been binge eating, Netflixing and ice creaming for the past two weeks. Okay, let's talk about what happened the last two weeks, right? Um, it kind of already sets the tone. And then when you couple that with the question about anxiety and depression and uh, what has happened recently, recent stress or significant life changes, you get an idea of what's bringing your client to therapy without, because I think persons come in, they sit in the chair and they're like, I don't know where to start. And I'm like, okay, take a breath. We're going to start this together. This is how we start, you know, because they're like, I don't know what to talk about. Da, da, da. So if you give them a little structure, it makes it a little bit easier for them. And trust me, eventually we get to what brings you, even if we don't finish that form, because sometimes four out of 10 times, we won't finish that form until the next week because we got, we went down that rabbit hole of what happened recently. That's fine. I let people have their time. Right, but we'll get back to that form eventually, and we have to make goals, which we'll talk about just now. Okay. I have to say, I, I want to add in there. I think also that client assessment, um, I think it, it in a way helps, like as an icebreaker, because yes. I think that that was how we initially built a rapport, because it wasn't like you were just asking me questions; we were interacting. So, I mean, especially I remember we interacted a lot when we got to the family history section yeah. and yeah. we talked a lot and you shared some of your knowledge with things. And I think that was actually important for building our client therapist relationship very early on. The rapport yeah. that we had during that session, during that client's assessment. Because I think it was, it took up the very the entire first session. Yeah, Basically. yeah. sometimes I can, I've seen people zoom through that assessment. I'm like, okay, 
So let's talk about what's bringing you today then. <laughs> you know, you don't have any recent stress and you're not feeling anxiety, but it's maybe depression or maybe it's eating or whatever it is. And you'll find out. Some people finish that assessment together. We finish in 30 minutes. Some take up the whole session. Some have to, I have to wait till the next week to finish the back page, which talks about strengths and weaknesses and so on. Um, and do you like your work and so on? So right. it does, it does, it does. And trust me, I learn a lot. And remember that strength and weakness part. So at the back of the assessment, we ask about strength and weakness. And it is not just, in that moment, I'm not just gathering the information. Oh, okay, you say you're good at this, you say you're good at that, or you're not so great at this, or you want to improve on that. I'm also watching, and this is something I learned in Barbados in my internship, the speed at which people can talk positively about themselves or negatively about themselves. I have had so many clients who are like, I can only list one or two things for what are my strengths, but when you ask them what their weaknesses are, it's like six, seven, and do, 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 do. you know, and that does tell me something about how they feel about themselves, right? So it does, um, it does, it does have merit. Developing therapeutic goals. So this is the last thing on your assessment, and it is probably the most crucial element of therapy because without goals and therapeutic goals, we are just going to be spinning and spinning like a top. And so therapeutic goals and technically developing of objectives within those goals are essential for how we're going to move forward. People have asked me, oh, like, how do you know how long someone's going to be in therapy? Sometimes I don't have uh, the perfect number of how long someone's going to be in therapy. Um, but depending on if from that first session, I get an, an understanding that there's trauma, someone who's coming for trauma related therapeutic goals are going to have a much longer ex estimated session times than someone who's coming in for maybe anger management. I've treated anger management in like nine sessions, but then I might treat someone with trauma in like 20 sessions. It just depends. Right. So, um, Riza, we're yeah. a little short in time. Yeah. Um, I think out of all of these processes, I think one of the things uh, I would really want us to touch on is the termination, the actual yeah. termination within sure. the process. Uh, if we can touch on that a bit. Um, sure. Yeah, because we're literally yeah. short on time. I know. I was that watching is, the time since, since I started. That was very like, special to me. Termination. <laughs> termination, right. So I included this as discussion on termination and then actual termination. So the discussion on termination comes from the point above, which is checking with goals and progress. So throughout your therapy session, whether you're there for six months, two months, obviously the longer you are, the more likely you're going to be checking in on the goals and the progress. Once there is an agreement that, yes, you think you're doing better, I think you're doing better, what were the things that brought you in, have those symptoms reduced, how are you going to delve or how are we going to deal with this thing if it pops up? And so there's a, that discussion beforehand, which is discussing termination. If it is an agreement that you both think that you've done well and you want to move on or you want to take a break, but you have the skills to take that break, then termination. And this discussion happens at least three weeks out from the actual anticipation in the therapist's mind. Like if that conversation goes well, your, ter your therapist is probably thinking, okay, I'm going to good give this person about three more sessions or two more sessions. And then we're going to do our final termination. And I have a very distinct way of doing termination. Again, I'm not sure how many other therapists in Guyana do their termination like this, but technically termination is really supposed to be a review of what you came with, what did you go through, what are you gonna leave with, and a plan for like success. So in Chris's, in Chris's case, he, he went through, what did he come with? What were his backgrounds? Um, what was his coping mechanisms then? What are his new coping mechanisms? Um, what were the goals? And this was all like written out, handwritten, mind you, handwritten, right? For first, <laughs> right? And, and then, you know, uh, what were the goals? Did we accomplish them? How, and then I added in two new things. And Chris was the first person I did this with, and I do it now for everybody, which is what were the, all the interventions? Every single thing, whether it's CBT, triangulation, unmet emotional needs, the 
emotional wheel, whatever it is. I list all because sometimes you can be in therapy and you don't know what your therapist is doing, like oh, asking yeah. a strange question. That was an intervention. And so oh, I'll yeah. tell you all of the new things that you learned. And then they'll be like, wow. And then the second new thing that I, I had, well, thing that I had put in at that time is what have you said? I don't have a category for it. It's like, what have you said? And so I am, as in every week in therapy, I'm writing down sometimes a positive, but sometimes a negative thing that you're saying. Oh, yeah. So I'm looking at your language and your negative thoughts coming out. out. And when you acknowledge this, it enough. I actually remember this in my termination. Now that you mentioned it, uh, you actually pointed out the way I changed in my yes. speech yes. as, you know, as positives, because yes. I remember when I started therapy, you asked me to describe my depression and I described it as like a dark cloud that's always looming over me. And then by the end of it, you said, how would you describe your depression? Or I, I don't think you asked me, but I said, yes. it's more like a small animal just lurking yes. in the back somewhere. Small, it's there, but, dad, and dog. I remember you pointed that out. I actually forgot this until you just mentioned language. That is something you use with me specifically. Yes. I do remember yes. it indeed. Because sometimes in clients, I guess like Chris, when they are saying, outwardly negative things it's easy to catch them Zoop, just catch it and write it in so what i did with that um instance is you want to demonstrate a pattern here this is how you were viewing the world and yourself and so on and then after x amount of weeks we start to see that change right and that's kind of like a guideline of like okay if they were concerned about their negative thinking pattern well here's evidence because therapy is usually evidence-based there are more evidential based um, therapies than others. And so this is in termination, how you would, you know, solidify that you have come a long way and have improved. Great. So, so that was right. And it's an open door policy. Just because you've terminated doesn't mean that you can't come back. I check in with my clients, most of my clients twice a year. And I do encourage those who have been terminated to come back at least once or twice a year just to check in and do your checkup. And your I do want to say that was important for me because th that Riza told me that because she knows that when we had this termination conversation like a month before I was being terminated, I had a whole <laughs> breakdown about it. <laughs> it's it's funny. I, I was I was doing well and then thinking about what might happen if I started doing bad actually made me go into a bad place. And I went to her very emotional. She actually noticed and she was like, what's wrong? And I, you know, very emotionally told her that I'm worried about being terminated. Like what's gonna happen if I slip up? And she said, the, you know, the whole reason I'm terminating you is because you're doing so well, you're well equipped. <laughs> and luckily she was able to talk some sense into you me. You can do it. <laughs> this is the importance of termination being a process and not just an event, like a one-time thing. So I think having more sessions and then having like the open door policy and so definitely like help calm me down and bring me back down to earth when I was freaking out. Yeah, and we have to do that way because imagine if Chris just showed up to session and I was like, okay, today's termination. He would have had a complete <laughs> breakdown. So oh, no, yes. termination needs to be a discussion and then an actual event and there must be time between it. Right. I know, so Queen, I know we're wrapping up. I know we're short on time. But one thing I just want to say that wasn't touched on is uh -huh. the homework. There will be homework. Like Raisa said, therapy is not lying on a couch and having your therapist listen to you and say, mm -hmm. so how does that make you feel? It's a lot of work. And it's a lot of hard work. You get homework. You get things to read. And along with that, just know that therapy is not always like a bed of roses. Like you will have very terrible days. And you will have days where you feel like you're not making progress. You will have days when it feels like all your issues like didn't go anywhere. They just came back up out of nowhere. And Riza can attest to the fact that I had some of those some of those days. And because I did, I've been able to tell people, you know, it's gonna be fine. I know you feel like you're not making any progress because you had this one bad day, but you are. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. It's, and it's, it's very individualized. The journey's different for everybody. Correct. So Christopher and Riza, 
I must say thank you very much for coming on today's program. It was really interactive. And for those who are now joining, just remember today's session was on sexual orientation and mental health because today is World Mental Health Day. And today we had Raisa, who's a psychologist, and Christopher, who is an activist on LGBTQ plus and mental health. And they had a really great session. And as you realize, Raisa, who is a psychologist, was a psychologist. So I must say thank you very much, everyone, for tuning in today on Tea Time Conversation with yours truly. Remember, this program is live stream on Facebook at SRHR Adventures with Dr. Pat. And also you can find today's session on my Instagram page, Tea Time Conversations. So with that being said, I will end today's session with a video. Do enjoy and have a blessed day, everyone. And remember, your mental you health is important. And put self-care first it's the most important thing love is love you all thank you so much thanks Akia. Yes. bye, bye. <laughs>
You just have to respect it. Just respect it. That makes sense. So we just have to be decent human beings? Yes. We can try to do that. Just give everyone the space to be wherever they want to be. Hi guys, my name is Durga Gaudi. I'm a gender fluid person. Hi everyone, my name is Sushandil Geekar. Hi, this is Doyle. And my pronouns are they, them and they are. My pronouns are he and him. My pronouns are she, her and hers. We can all exist together. Because this world is a huge space and this space for all of us, we all can exist together. So you don't have to get it. All you need to do is respect it. You might not get us, but you can respect us. You just, just remember, you don't have to get it. You just have to respect it. Thank you.